was known as the penman of the American Revolution. Hello, I'm Jackie Ferris. This week, the 302 is visiting the John Dickinson Plantation and learning about his important role in history that has gone unnoticed by many. Get ready to learn, the 302 is digging into history. Hey 302, John Dickinson was known as the penman of the revolution, but not too many people know about him. We're gonna talk a little bit about his life, his work, and his impact on the revolution and our government today. I'm joined now by site supervisor of the John Dickinson Plantation, Gloria Henry. Gloria, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. So he, John Dickinson was known as the penman of the revolution, but a lot of people don't know who he was. Why is that? Well, we're standing here, actually sitting here, in front of his boyhood home. This is where he grew up from about the age of 8 to 18. And he went to England, studied law, and then came back. And then he stepped into history, I say, by stepping into politics. So he became famous as the years went by because he was an absolute guaranteed writer of individual rights. Especially here in the colonies, we were still considered the colonies of Great Britain, and he's writing about individual and colonial rights, and even while he's writing about them, he's still owning people. He still has people, human beings, in bondage. And so John Dickinson was a prolific writer at the time. He was a framer and signer of the U.S. Constitution. He became governor of Delaware and the next year governor of Pennsylvania. And so John Dickinson was very famous at the time. He wrote a letters of a, from a Pennsylvania farmer. He became very popular during this time. He knew George Washington. He argued with Benjamin Franklin. And, <laughs> so, Thomas and Thomas Jefferson. And knew Thomas Jefferson. And so John Dickinson was very famous for his time period. But when he didn't sign the Declaration of Independence, he lost a lot of his popularity. And so he goes home, brings his family here, he picks up a gun and he fights in the war, the Revolutionary War. And then he comes back home and that's when they decide to build the country. And John Dickinson is back and called back in service. He helps write the Articles of Confederation and then he's a framer for the U.S. Constitution. And so he got lost in history, probably because he didn't sign the Declaration of Independence, but here in Delaware, we still think that he is important enough to tell his story. And we not only tell the stories of John Dickinson and the Dickinson family, but the tenant farmers who lived here, the enslaved individuals who lived, worked, and died here on this plantation. So we think everyone's story is important to tell, and that's what we do here. Now, we're going to tell or talk about the folks um, that lived here, that worked here, um, voluntarily or involuntarily. But I wanted to, to go back a little bit and talk about the reason Dickinson didn't sign the Declaration of Independence was because um, while he had been here and he had been working for a lot of the causes of the colonists trying to keep taxes down with the Stamp Act, the Sugar Act, all these writings that he did to benefit colonists, in the back of his mind, he was still kind of hoping for a re reconciliation, is that right? He was hoping for reconciliation, but once the tide was turning and he recognized that, he absolutely abstained from voting. He didn't actually vote against it, he abstained from voting, and then he picks up a gun, and then he fights in the war. And so, John Dickinson also wanted to have help from other countries, and so these are some of the things that were weighing on his mind. Um, in one frame he said, it was like burning your house in winter before you had another. Don't forget, the colonies weren't exactly united at this time. And so that was also another thing that he was worried about. So he wasn't just worried about the war and surviving the war, but what we were going to have after the fact. Afterwards. Now, he um, had received a lot of compliments from, from famous men in his day, both uh, in the United States and elsewhere. I, I guess Voltaire was very complimentary of his writings, and uh, as well as other heads of state 
um, in other countries and, and his uh, countrymen, uh, Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson, even though there was a little friction. I mean, he was a prolific writer. Yes, he was. John Dickinson, um, as I said before, he went to England, studied law in Middle Temple. So he was a very well-educated man. Even here, before he went to study, he actually had tutors live here and tutored him here at his home. And so when he went to England, he really completed his studies and he really believed in English law. And he thought that this is how we were supposed to apply that law here in the colonies. And so John Dickinson put pen to paper and expressed his beliefs and his thoughts in a way that the average person could understand it. So he was the, uh, the every man's man, yes. so to speak. So how long did he live here? So he lived here about from the age of 8 to 18. So he moved here in January of 1740 with his father Samuel, his mother Mary, and his younger brother Philemon. And so this was his boyhood home. And he stayed here, he was tutored here, he learned how to run this plantation. And so what we have here is his boyhood home that he came to visit. He often, when his father died, he inherits this property. He's living in Philadelphia. He's got his law practice. He is involved in the assembly. He's involved in politics. He really doesn't want to come back down here and farm the land. So this becomes now a tenant house. So you have a variety of families living here over time, like Mr. and Mrs. White and the Emery's and the Kimmies and the Johnsons. And they're the ones farming the land farm him. And John Dickinson is coming back. He gives them advice. He, his lease agreements are really advantageous to him, but they're also very strict on what they can and cannot do here on this property. So if they really want to do something, they're gonna to have to contact John Dickinson or his agent. And if he says yes, he'll pay for it. If not, it's gonna come out of their pocket. So because he's not living here, we have a lot of documentation on what was going on here. And those are the stories that we tell here. And we're gonna tell some of those stories in just a minute when we return. Hi, Heidi Benson here, artist teacher at the Center for Creative Arts, inspiring your creative journey here on the 302. Welcome back. We're at the John Dickinson Plantation, and we talked a little bit with Gloria about um, John Dickinson being living here from birth to age 18. Then he becomes a politician, and he's in Philadelphia. So he rents this plantation and this home out to other people. And you say that this is where uh, the next chapter begins for the plantation. Mm -hmm. So when John Dickinson becomes the owner of this plantation, he's living in Philadelphia. He doesn't want to come back here and take over the running of the plantation, even though this is where he's getting some of his wealth. They're growing corn, wheat, flax, other small grains. They've got orchards here. So this was a very large undertaking. And so he wanted to be very careful about who he leases out the house and the land to. And so he has, he advertised in the paper, he advertises and he leases out the house, the grounds, and the enslaved individuals. In return, he gets money, like gold and silver, some of the crops they're growing, some of the animals they're raising, and even some of the products, like soap and candles that they're making here. So the lease agreements are very, very carefully written out. And John Dickinson leases out to people like Mr. and Mrs. White. William and Deborah. Now, William and Deborah White are leasing out this main house, but they have a few problems of their own. So when they're leasing out the house, um, there are letters going back and forth between John Dickinson and Mr. and Mrs. White about what's going on here, about what they want to grow here. Mrs. White writes a letter to John later years, talks about she wants to grow a turnip patch. She also writes to John Dickinson about some of the problems that they're having here. William White has a little problem. He actually goes into a tavern and he gets into a fight. Or I should say, he takes the butt of his hunting whip and he hits another gentleman over the head. That gentleman dies a few, in the next day and William White is put on trial for manslaughter. So you can imagine the Dickinsons are learning about their tenants and what's going on here because even though they're leasing out the house to John, from John Dickinson, there are other tenants in the area 
who are also writing to John Dickinson to tell him what the people in this house are doing, those concerned neighbors, <laughs> even in the 18th century. Now, William White is eventually found not guilty, and he continues to live in this house until he dies. And then Mrs. White stays here for a short period of time, and then he moves her to another house called Upper Place. And so even though John Dickinson um, is renting out to families, in later years you find that he is also renting out to um, white women and African-American men. And then later, some of the former enslaved individuals are also, being le are also leasing out land and houses from John Dickinson. I wanted to ask you about um, the slaves that he left on the plantation, I guess, that were part of the rental. Talk to me about those folks. So in the lease agreement, he actually writes down what they, are, what they may be able to do. And the advertisements, they talk about that John's enslaved labor is skilled labor, that they're skilled in carpentry, they're skilled in tanning. So these are skills that you would want to have on a plantation like this. And so that, those skilled labor, those people that lived and worked and died here are being leased out because they're considered property are being leased out and they are to be treated, as John wrote in the lease agreement, with care, but that's a relative term, what people consider care for other people, if they consider them property to begin with. Now these people that um, were the tanners, um, the, the slaves here, did they have their own families or were they just part of a, of a group? They had their own families. So we know this because in 1780, in 1777, John Dickinson um, writes a manumission document. And in that document, it names the men, the women, and then the children of. So we now, he's put them in family groupings. And so we now know who, who is related to whom based on John Dickinson's document. And in that, he says that you're going to be free in 21 years. Did that happen? <sighs> Not exactly. That was what he wrote in 1781. Uh, sorry, in 1777. In 1781, he writes another manumission document and he frees six people unconditionally. Then in 1786, he decides to free everyone unconditionally. And so that included some of the people he, he had listed in the 1777 document and in the 1781 document. And he names them all and he says, any he may have forgotten. So you can imagine that at this moment, you now have people who are free, living and working in this area, people who are enslaved because the tenants who own or who lease the land, some of them own people, other people, and then you have people who are indentured. They sign a contract to work for other people, and some of the children who had been enslaved by John Dickinson are now indentured to John Dickinson, and they sign a contract with him. And so you have a variety of people living and working. Do they get along? No. But they do have to work together to try to make this plantation profitable for Mr. Dickinson. But there are plenty of instances in which there are some serious issues out here. Now, we're going to take a quick break, but when we come back, I want to talk to you about the Underground Railroad piece of all of this and a little bit about what you guys do present day. So we'll be right back. I'm Christopher Hall, the lead interpreter here at the Johnson Victoria Museum, and we love the sound of the 302. Welcome back. We're talking about uh, the history of the John Dickinson Plantation. Now, Gloria, talk to me about the um, Underground Railroad piece of this. We have been a member since 2008 to the National Park Service Underground Railroad Network to Freedom. And it was established to ensure institutions and historic sites and places and people who helped or escaped enslavement. And so we have three documented cases in which people sought their freedom. And one of them, as I mentioned Mr. White earlier, one of them has to do with Mr. White, Clem, who ran away in 1790 and he put out a runaway slave notice on him. 
in the Gazette and it actually tells a detailed description of what Clem was wearing and that he might have run away and that he might have um, impersonated one of the former slaves of John Dickinson. So all of that is listed in there. So we talk about the, the different instances in which people sought their freedom from here. So we're a little earlier than the Civil War, but we are, we are a member of the Network to Freedom and we do have an exhibit in our visitor center. That's amazing. And I know that you um, were talking about uh, while you have all these records and all this history that you can comb through now, you're actually digging, pardon the pun, you're digging through some history at present. Talk to me about that. In 2005, we decided to reopen our basement. And when we did, we had to reset the bricks and the floor. And so we took up a lot of dirt. And when we did, we put it in a location to, and left it there. <laughs> and so we get the opportunity now in 2020 to go through, sift through that dirt. So we have a public program in which people can sign up and they get a sifter and they get dirt <laughs> and they just go through it and we look for and find any bit of history that we can use to tell the story of what happened here. And so they found um, pieces of ceramics. Um, they have found uh, teeth of a cow, I believe. There were um, cufflinks. There have been bottle glass and plenty of bricks, lots of bricks that we found out there. So our next program is November the 21st and then we'll be shut down for the, um, the winter months for the program, but we'll be starting that program up again, hopefully in the springtime. So we encourage people to sign up if they're interested, <laughs> um, but that program in the spring will be just another program of going through the dirt that we have found here and finding whatever piece that will help us interpret life here on this plantation. Now I know um, we all spent a good portion of 2020 just doing nothing. And it was difficult for um, organizations and museums like yourself to really do anything. So hopefully when people, you know, spring comes, we can come out again. COVID free, what's the tour like of the, of the house? What do you see inside the house? So inside the house, we have restored the house to a time period of when John Dickinson is owning the house. So we interpret anywhere from 1730, when John, 32, when John Dickinson was born, to even after um, he died and Sally, his daughter, owns the house. So when you go inside, you'll see period antiques from that time period. You see a few pieces like our John and Mary Dickinson teapot that we believe was given to them as a wedding present. So you see a few pieces that belong to the Dickinson family. So some rooms are interpreted as the very wealthy Dickinson family. Other rooms are interpreted as the, the tenant farmers who lived in this house. And still other rooms reflect the fact that this house and the labor that was done here um, was um, done by enslaved individuals and, and um, indentured servants. So we try to show everyone's lifestyle because that's what's reflected in the house and that's what was reflected in reality. It really is gorgeous when you open this door, which is original to the 1800s, right? Mm -hmm. You walk in and it's like a, a, you, you go back in time. Now I know that in the future you have lots of plans that you'd like to, to tackle and there's so much beauty out here. You've got a garden and talk to me about the, the outbuildings and everything on the periphery here. In 1980 they decided that they wanted to expand not just the mansion but the story of the people who were working here and they needed to do that by talking about what was being done here. And so they're growing and there are um, orchards and there's a little bit of everything out here. So we had to have the outbuildings to reflect this as a working farm. So we have a reconstructed granary, reconstructed feed barn, double corn crib, stable, and the smokehouse. Now the smokehouse is an actual working smokehouse. So I could smoke some meat in there, and we've done that on occasion. <laughs> and we also have one more building, and that is a log dwelling. It's the type of structure that you would have found in Kent County, in this rural area of Kent County. And enslaved individuals would live in a house like that, and also um, poor families. This is the type that you would find, that building is the type you would find scattered throughout this landscape. And all of this is uh, built into your programming, right? If, if you come out, you go to, and you can learn about, you know, the smokehouse. You can learn about the different 
structures. Yes, you can tour them on your own. You can get a guided tour. Um, and so yes, the buildings are for the most part open. And so you can see them even now during this time of COVID, we do have um, plexiglass in the doors so that you can actually go in and take a look at them. So our grounds are open, and so anyone could come out and take a look at the outbuildings. And you get lots of stuff online, right? Well, we have a lot of, we have things online. <laughs> I don't know about how much is a lot, but we do have things online, and we'll be putting more up as the time continues. Mm -hmm. And more programming for 2021. Yes, definitely. Um, we really love to do hands-on activities, such as, um, making sachets and the smokehouse and hearth cooking, um, dyeing, cloth dyeing. We like to do those things, so we would love and we will love to get back to doing some of the hands-on activities with the guests that come and visit. All right, well, thank you so much for spending time with us and, and giving us a history lesson. Well, thank you for coming to visit. You bet. We'll be right back. information on all of the programs here at the John Dickinson Plantation, be sure to visit their Facebook page. That'll do it for us for this episode. We leave you now with an aerial view of the plantation. Until next time, I'm Jackie Ferris. We'll see you on the 302.